Ooh, Golden State. I like that hat. I have the same one, but blue. All right, everybody. So if there's anybody else who shouldn't be in the mess hall that can hear me right now, this is the voice of God. <laughs> Come on back. This is God speaking. This is Jesus. You'll miss out on the rapture if you don't come back in here. So whoever is up there. Oh, kids ministry. By the way, we don't have kids ministry today. Can you hear me? We don't have any teachers today, so you guys will be staying in here. If you can uh, withstand the, uh, the patience of listening to me. Yeah, we don't have any teachers for today. They're out on vacation. So even teachers go on vacations too. So feel free to just run around the room, and I'm prepared for it. I've been preparing myself mentally, okay? So we don't have children's ministry today or kids' church, and so all the kids, feel free to just sit back and just do whatever you need to do, okay? I'm ready for you. <laughs> I'm prepared. Yes, Tito Richard will preach. All right, so um, one of the things I always want to uh, start with is asking you guys how you've represented Jesus outside of this space. And I love this time because it holds us accountable to the fact that we should not just be doing church in here. And I actually have prizes for the people who are going to come up here because I live in a condo. And so we get all these all sorts of flyers and stuff like that. And they're literally my favorite because sometimes A&W gives you these coupons that literally just say free coffee or like free root beer. And so here's the thing, we get one, but then the thing is, I'm like, people don't even look at their, you know, that junk mail and stuff like that, they threw it in the recycling bin. <laughs> so I'm in our condo, like, looking through, because we got a bunch of, uh, I got like, I got like 20 of them, of free A&W root beer, like, no purchase at all. This is not product placement, <laughs> like, I don't have shares in A&W, but this is literally just, you don't have to buy anything, it's just free root beer, it's free pop. And so this my, I got like 20 of them, and so I'm going to give some away to whoever wants to come up. Yeah, pretty good prize, right? I was like ravaging through. And <laughs> Clarissa just shakes her head when she sees me when I do that. Well, I like free stuff, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, exactly. All right, so want to congratulate uh, Jeff and Steph for their wedding up here. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just give it. <laughs> Congratulations. We are glad to be witnesses of this memorable moment in your lives. I'm just kidding. This is, <laughs> this is the first time Jeff and Steph are uh, doing worship here. <laughs> Clarissa and Kat are like, stop it, stop. <laughs> yeah, well, this is their first time leading worship with, uh, with the team. Give them a round of applause. All right, so back to what I was talking about. How have you represented Jesus? How have you been a light wherever you've been? How have you stepped out in faith and actually loved somebody who's in front of you, whether that's a friend, a family member, or a complete stranger? If you don't know what this looks like, I'm going to give you an example. And it's hard for me to get examples because, you know, one, once it becomes like just a lifestyle, you just kind of just do it. it. You don't really think about it. And so I find myself kind of, oh, this one's a good one. I've shared this with the young adults before. Um, what does this look like? Because some of you who are new here don't know what this looks like, but it's actually a lot more easier and normal than you think. Um, my wife and I bought a bed uh, a few, a little while ago, and we bought a bed at the brick, and it was, we bought the bed, and the, the sales lady that was selling to us, I felt like God was like, tell this lady that I'm looking after her, I love her, and I care for her. But I was like hesitating the whole time, and I didn't really, long story short, we closed the transaction, we bought the bed, we, I didn't get to do it, okay? So we start using the bed, we, we're sleeping on it, we're like, you know, our backs kind of hurt, it's uncomfortable and stuff. A couple weeks later, we're like, hey, we got to return this, because they have a one-time return thing, exchange thing. Um, Sounds like I have a lot of product placement. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, so I had to go back. I felt like, okay, we have to get back and we have to go try to find another one that is better uh, suited for us, probably better for our backs and stuff like that because it's, sleep is a good investment. And so went back there. Lady was so nice. Same lady. She was the one helping us and stuff like that. I'm like, ah. I started to feel like God did this for a reason, that there was such an urgency that he wouldn't let me just get away with not giving this person the word that he has for. Because the thing is, God is our Father, and He left us His Holy Spirit. 
So that means that right now in this stage of human history, we are his spokespersons, right, to the world. The world will hear God the loudest through our lives and through how we talk, how we live, how we speak, okay? And so I'm there and I'm thinking, ah, God, you are tricky or you are very sneaky, sneaky. And so what I did was we made the transaction of talking to her and I had a little bit of moment with her and I told her, you know what, this is what happened. I explained to her, came back, and I feel like God just really, really wanted you to know this because he sent me back here in order for me to get this. And gave her the word, I got to pray for her, and it came back, bed came and stuff like that, and we were so comfortable. There was like, oh, it's like, like, it's like you needed to do that. It's kind of like Jonah, you know. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, Nineveh but God, that, it was so urgent that God wouldn't let him not go because there were lives on the line. And I feel like sometimes God is like that, that there are people around us that he needs to speak through us and to them, and he won't let us get away with it. There's some moments where you know he lets us get away with it. We're like, God, next time, next time, or send somebody else, you know? But that moment, it's like he's like, nope, you're coming back, and you're going to make sure that the message is sent to this person. And so that's what it kind of looks like. You don't, it's not something that is weird to you. It's just something that's natural because God loves that person so much. And so that's what I want to ask you. I want, oh, which mic am I going to use, Gabe? Which, which mic? Does anyone? This one? Okay. So I want to ask, are there any testimonies on how you stepped out in faith, how you loved somebody, represented Jesus to them, however way, shape, or form that looks like for you? Any volunteers? Free root beer. Thank you, my bro. All right. So take the mic for me. Any volunteers here? Tita Elva, you had one last time, right? What we didn't get to share. Do you remember that? You forgot it now. Okay. Tita Elvi does it so much that she just forgets because there's just so much, you know? <laughs> it's a true story. Anyways, so who wants to come up bold enough to share about how they represented Jesus, how they loved somebody the way Jesus would if he was present here today? I'm on. Take the mic from me. I'm not uncomfortable with silence. I'm just going to wait because I know there's somebody. There's at least two people, I feel like, in my heart. There's at least two people that really stepped out in faith. So, there you go. Tito, come on down. There we go. Praise the Lord. Good morning, Paul. Um, I just want to share. It's not about uh, representing Jesus, but it's about a prayer that was answered. So, I have with me... Uh, friend of mine when I was still young, we grew up in the same church, and though they, they are married, they came from the Philippines, and uh, yeah, they are here today, so it's Brother Rex and Marife, and so I, I would like to share to you about them coming here in North America, so it, it is the first time for them to come here to fly to North America, and I was praying because, of course, sila din po medyo na kinakabahan din po punta first time sa North America, they're just traveling, so I was praying that sana sila ay, uh, there's somebody that's going to guide them. So, when they reach here in Calgary, there is there's this one guy na nakilala nila. And since nalaman nila that they came from the Philippines and it's their first time to travel, sila po ay tinulungan, inassist. To make the long story short, nagkwentohan kami sa airport, and then I was saying that they are my friends since... We grew up in the same church. And nagulat siya. Are you Christian? He says, yes, we are. Christian din siya. Praise the Lord. Amen. And you know what? Ang pangalan niya ay Louis, and he knows you. Yeah. The, 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 from the same church that you've been to. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So nagulat ako. Was, you know Pastor Richard? Yeah. Richard. I was saying Richard uh, Banag. And no, the, the, the young guy. Yeah, Richard Sampang. Yeah, he was with us before. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So everything works together for good. Amen? Praise the Lord. That is good. Thank you, Tito. Yeah, that's awesome. That is really a small world. Okay. Clarissa and I have this problem where we can't go anywhere where we don't know anybody, right? We literally, like, we went to Waterton yesterday. We saw somebody again that we know. We're like, everywhere we go, there's just somebody that we know. It's really crazy. Um, give God something to work with. Give God something to work with. Give God something to work with. That's what I see there. What if you are the answer to someone's prayer? Right? What? 
that's no coincidence. Welcome, by the way. Welcome to Calgary. It's awesome. Yeah. I know what it feels like. Our first time here was in 2001, and so welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today, too. All right. Tito, you get a free root beer, okay? Actually, because you guys can all have root beers because this is your welcoming gift. Here you go. You all get one. There's four of you here, okay? Wow. See, this is the reward of me ravishing through garbage. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, no, Clarissa, I'm ready. No, I did not sanitize it, and that's... It's a recycling bit, Tita Mai. It's okay. <laughs> it's all just paper. Scratch my eye, pink eye. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Who else wants to share? Uh, how have you represented Jesus? How have you lived that? Exactly that. Just really live it, okay? Neil, you look like you're, you're jumpy out there. You got something, bro? Come here, dude. You got something to share. Yeah, you do. Is a good man. I've been literally watching this guy grow, and I'm just so proud of this guy. Oh, there you go. So, what's up, guys? I don't so, usually share, but uh, it hap this happened um, like a month ago. I was at down um, Chinook Station. I was with my friend, and he was just about to leave me because I we ate at a restaurant, and I had the uh, spare change for a ticket train ticket and as I was about to uh, get the ticket there's this uh, indigenous person came up to me and said do you have like spare change so I can get to the train I don't know where I I was like God gave me like to give this man the uh, uh, spare change I'll take care of you so I gave him the spare change that I had without even thinking and then I was like, after that, I was like, okay, so how do I get home? <laughs> Fortunately, my friend texted me. I was like, yo, I'll, I'll pick you up. I'm here at Chinook Station. So I was like, wow. God, God is good. That's awesome. That's really trusting in God. And here's the thing that we have to, thank you, brother. Appreciate you, man. Um, here's the thing. We have to watch out for, I know there's the whole thing about like being careful with uh, giving money to homeless people and stuff like that. And, but what if, because God led him, that it's his kindness that leads people to repentance? Right? We don't know where that money's going to go, but that act of kindness, what if he just gave God something to work with? And we have to be careful with that because in our hearts we're like, oh, where are they going to use that? It doesn't matter. If God called you to, you just got to do it and he'll take care of it. He knows what he's doing. He's God. Bro, you got a root beer. <laughs> All right, I'll have your root beer for you. <laughs> Is there another one? Kat, you look like you have one. And then Jeff, do you have one? Am I putting you on the spot here? No? You want to take the mic? This is honestly like in our Bible studies for like the junior youth, youth, and young adult, we do this. And it's like literally my favorite part. Come on. And then we'll have Jeff. Um, you want to take the mic? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, give her a round of applause. Let me think. Okay. Um, you, know how, you notice that, how quickly that was. That's why I'm so proud of this girl because she just, it just, it's there. It's because she just lives it. That's okay, me putting um, you on the spot. Okay, bye. Uh, um, I'll just tell you guys about um, the two friends that I've been ministering to. And yeah, I think it's just sharing life with them. And like, you know, like just basically like hanging out and like, Okay, I've been like, ah, oh yeah. Um, yeah, there's this friend of mine. She's, oh, Kuya, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Yeah, um, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I've been sharing my, like, like, testimonies like multiple testimonies with my like two friends and I, I really see growth in them and like just I re I've really been praying for them to just um, you know just pursue Christ 
in their life and yeah sorry yeah yeah that's okay that's her holding back her tears because you know when you love people it's just overwhelming sometimes you know and you live intentionally like that all right jeff you're the last one here here i'll give you a root beer too so a few weeks back uh there was i went to the bank and this guy uh, he looked like he was homeless he came to me and he's just asking me if i had any extra bottles in the truck because i have a landscaping company and sometimes we drink uh, water bottles or something like that so i said yeah here you go we might have one and so we gave him one and then i'm like you know what i'm gonna just buy him some groceries or something i said you want me to you want uh you want you need something from the the store like you want uh some food or something like that and he's like really he's like man like that's awesome like thank you and and so i went and gave him something and then um he just felt like like his spirits just totally changed you know like he just really uh got really happy and you know i just told him a little bit uh you know like just told him god bless you and you know this is not from me this is from god you know and he wants to just bless you with it because god has been a blessing in my life and i want to bless you because of it and so and he just felt really encouraged by that and he said you know like i'm a believer too you know but but uh, you know things have been really rough in my life and you know but you know like you really helped me in um feeling a little bit better you know so yeah, it was it was kind of nice to to see that that could happen and he he didn't even ask me i just I just did it, you know. Like I, I think that sometimes the homeless people, they're a little bit weary on asking people, and maybe embarrassed, you know, and um, they might not even know. But I think um, that's why I felt like even more of an urge to give it to him, you know, as well. Anyways, and I think Steph has something too. Oh, okay. Well, you guys are a package deal, so yeah. come on up, Steph. Go ahead. <laughs> um. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, when I was uh, in the Philippines, I am a youth leader, so it's um, every time I always go to their house, so and visit them and always telling to them, oh, we have this uh, youth service. Can you come? And it's like uh, almost two to three years, <laughs> and we're only like two to three people. Sometimes me and my cousin. And then sometimes I feel like kind of discouraged because I feel like it's not like I'm not it's not working. You know, I feel is there anything bad to me or they don't like me or whatever. So um, but I still, you know, keep going and always going to their house, encourage them. And they will just tell to me, yeah, I will go. And then during that time, they will like, go. <laughs> And I'm worried because I will go to Canada soon. And um, my parents or the other elders are worried too if there's any youth that will still stay there, you know. And then I was surprised, you know, that um, I'm telling to those two youths that, you know, even though that I will not be here, I want you to continue to grow. And uh, yeah, until, and now I see that um the youth is i was surprised because it's like they're seven to ten now and then you know and i praise god you know that <laughs> all those um hardship and you know even though that um i don't know if they want to see me and the, every time that they see me they want to hide oh there's a stephanie he will tell he will tell to me to go to to church again and i said Oh, no, you know, I'm, I'm telling, you know, God really miss you so much, you know. He is telling to you that he loves you, but when you when will you visit him? And they said, yeah, I know. So, yeah, I praise God because God used me through them, and I'm happy that they are growing, and praise God. Thank you, Steph. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. See, sometimes we think that the little thing that we do or this this quick thing that we do, it's just not... It's not, we're not seeing the fruits, but that's the thing, right? When it comes to God, he's not limited by time. He works through it, right? In the, in the moment that we do it, it's like we don't see the results right away. But God just, man, the way when you give him something to work with, he multiplies it. 
the fish and the loaves. You put it in his hands, it just multiplies. By the way, Kat, if I can just speak this to you, the reason why I, I kind of wanted to bring you up here, because I believe that you will do that a lot. You will speak to hundreds of thousands of people, and you're going to reach a lot of people. This, uh, we're praying for her to be able to go to this YWAM training thing in California. Uh, so join us in praying for her uh, and getting her passport right away so that she can get going with this. But this is a woman on a mission, like really just loving people wherever she goes, especially in the school and the context that she's in. And so um, just want to, you will do this more, so get used to it, if I can speak that into you. Um, anyway, so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into the Word of God, and I'm going to get you out of here. You can have your barbecues, Canada Day, go enjoy the, the sunshine, okay? And enjoy your family, friends, company. Father, we just want to thank you. We surrender this time to you. We thank you that your people are alive. Your church is alive. And they are active and they're going out there and living how you would if you were walking on earth today. Father, we just want to surrender this time to you as we, we just digest, ingest and digest your word. I pray that it would just energize us and just launch us to the season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Braden or Jerry, am I going to... Is it on there? We're going to be studying through Ephesians 2, basically like, um, can you see that real good? Uh, Ephesians 2, we're going to be studying through Ephesians 2 today, basically the whole chapter of Ephesians 2. Um, but what I did was I picked out bits and pieces of it, but I will give you, basically, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, I did an expository, meaning I squeezed out the lessons out of this and just did a study on it. I'm going to paint you a picture of what's happening in Ephesians 2. And then from there, we're going to extract the lessons. And then from there, we're going to see what practical things we can take out of this and just let it transform our lives, okay? So first of all, my question for you guys is, I knew it, and I'm ready for this. I'm ready. <laughs> Pastor Richard Banag told me that last week. We don't have a kid's church today. And so I'm like, ooh, I'm so ready. So it's okay. Let them. Let them do their thing. I'm so ready for this. I prepared myself. So my question is, my, the title of my message today is, please sign here. Have you ever had that said to you? Whether it's a bank or a dealership or a uh, whatever it is, a, a, a student loan contract, some kind of contract, right? You ever have somebody say to you, just please sign here? Have you ever had to sign a contract that maybe restricted some of your freedom? Like, an example is maybe like a mortgage or leasing or financing a car or taking on a student loan. Everybody nod if you've ever had, you know, the way this kind of works is instead of that chunk of money going to whatever you want it to go to, instead it has to be locked into paying that monthly thing. Is that making sense? So in a way, it kind of restricted where you can use that. And, and I've noticed that I, and you might know some people who are like this, some people think about their Christian walk like this. Have you ever heard people say um, things like, before I take God seriously, I want to live my life first. I can follow him later and take him seriously later. Right? You guys ever heard that? So, before, like, I've, I've heard multiple people say this, and so I wanted to, this is something that I've kind of extracted from Ephesians 2 here, because the reality is, when, when we take on a relationship with God, when we commit to a relationship with him, are we taking on something that is inferior or something that is superior? We, we know that, right? But do we, we know, do we know what we're getting ourselves into? Do we know some of the greatest benefits that we get out of this love relationship with him? Because for a lot of people, and, and if you are in here, you are, you've been in the faith for a long time, I want to go through this chapter with you, Ephesians 2, because I want you to be able to speak to people why living a Christian life is not restrictive. It is liberating. Why this is the best thing. And I, I'm speaking from experience because growing up, I did make my, my, my share of mistakes, drinking, partying, valuing things that don't really matter. But once God has taken a hold of my life, I tasted and saw that he is good and I couldn't go back. And so when I hear people saying like, oh, let me experience this first. Let me try this first. Let me do that first. Let me live first. I'm like, dude, you don't even know what living's like until you know who God is. 
but a lot of people have that misconception. And so I just want to journey with you this, uh, this morning in, in finding out what did we get when we signed that contract, when we signed that covenant, when we signed and said, yes, God, I want to commit my life to you because I firmly believe, and that is the premise of my message, that we didn't sign up for something that's inferior. We signed up for something superior, something so much better than what we would have if we didn't have Jesus. Amen? It's like... This is the idea of it. It's like you sign a document that now limits that financial freedom. I've, uh, I want to share this with you. One of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to committing our lives to Jesus is that we got the short end of the stick. Often, what people, say, what people who say this or think those things are referring to are the parts of our relationship with God that seems like rules, right? They're like, oh, you guys don't know how to have fun or you don't know, like you, you can't go out on the weekends or like you're with your friends if you're a young person. You're, you don't drink? Like, why don't, why don't you go, like, why don't you party with us and stuff like that? I've heard that before, too, and I've faced it myself. Often what people who say or think those things are referring to are the parts of our relationship with God that seems like rules that hinder one from truly enjoying life. But the reality is a life without boundaries put in place by a loving father is a life emptier than most who think this way would admit. Is that true? It is emptier. Someone once said, a life with no discipline is not a life of freedom, but a life of bondage. And this is so true. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with somebody who has an addiction problem, whether that's alcohol, pornography, um, anger issues, and stuff like that, whatever, whatever they're addicted to. If you've ever worked with somebody who has addiction issues, you know that they're not living a full life. If anything, one of the, or even drugs, okay? One of the, the things that I hear all the time when I work with people like that is they're like, like I just I, I like I, I don't know why I keep doing that. I just wanna, you know, I just wanna go back to the way it used to be when I was just I I used to be such a smart person. I used to be this, I used to be that. They're, it's like they're driving a car and they're in the passengers, they're in the driver's seat, but they have no control over the wheel. A life like that really sucks. Because you want to get to point A to point B, but you're going zigzag this, going back this. You never seem to get there. Am I making sense here? Someone once said, a life with no discipline is not a life of freedom, but a life of bondage. Because, why? Because you're a slave to whatever you feel, or you're reactive to the momentary things that come your way. Because a lot of them look at what we do and look at, oh, you guys don't do this, you don't do that. And they're like, how do you guys like have fun? I, I have a group of people that I was around with uh, not too long ago. And one of the things they said while we were hanging out, it's like, oh, like, it's like you guys don't have like beers or anything like that in here. You're like, man, I think it's a sad life when you can't enjoy it because you have to be intoxicated to, in order to enjoy life. Does that make sense? I think it's a really sad life if you have to be intoxicated in order to actually feel good about your situation. Because a lot of, there's some of the people that I grew up with, that I grew up with, that I tell them, I'm like, I don't need that stuff anymore because I found out something that is so much better. There was one guy in, uh, it was in, where was that? Uh, da, 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 da. Where does um, Fiesta Filipino happen? Olympic Plaza. Olympic Plaza. And I was like, just, just, representing Jesus to somebody there and I was talking to them and I was telling them like man I don't need to get high man because I have something that is so much better the most high I promise you it is so much better than what you're trying to escape and I'm just telling them that because it's so true it is so true people want to do that stuff because they want to escape life they want to get drunk they want to get really uh, just intoxicated with drugs and stuff because they want to escape something is that true but here's the thing that we have, and it's huge privilege, and we'll see it in Ephesians 2, is that we are given something so much better, not something that's inferior, that, that l limits our lives, but instead something that liberates us and propels us to a better life. What seems like rules from an outside perspective are loving guidelines from a relational perspective. Did you guys catch that? What seems like rules from an outside perspective, if you try to do what the Bible says outside of a relationship with God, they will seem like chores. Like, why would you do that? Like, wh why don't you just do this? You're like, no, it's because my God, who I love so much, I don't want to break his heart. It's a different perspective when you do it from a relational perspective. Because if you look at those rules or guidelines or restrictions mentioned in the Bible outside of a love relationship with a God that cares, they will without a doubt sound like limitations. Is that true? 
Likewise, the idea that giving our lives entirely to God uh, restricts a fulfilled life couldn't be more further from the truth. One of the most beautiful benefits of a life committed and surrendered to Jesus is a life more abundant, a taste of heaven here on earth. It's made available for us. Now, heaven is not just something that we see later on, that we experience later on. It's actually a fulfilled life right now, fulfilled in every aspect, financial, physical, mental, emotional, in every aspect. And so many people try to fill that gap with everything and anything else because they think that's the thing that's going to make them feel better. But here's the beauty of it, and Rick Warren says this all the time. He says, you weren't made for money. You weren't made for your career. You weren't made for your nice car. You weren't made even for your family. You were made for him. And so until you can fill your void with him, everything else will seem empty. And that's why you see some of the rich... We experienced it in just the last few weeks there. Some people who seem to have it all, riches and everything, committing suicide. You can have everything, but if you don't have that one thing that really matters, everything just seems like nothing. Is that making sense? Okay. Okay, 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 okay. A life not restricted, but rather a life liberated. That's the gift of Jesus. That's the gift of living for him. That's the Christianity. This is where our study for today takes us in Ephesians 2. It talks about what we gained because of what Jesus did and if we submit to him as Lord and Savior. And that is what we're going to be kind of uh, working through today. I'm going to give you a little bit of context and then I'm going to take some, some verses here that I believe summarizes the uh, chapter really well, okay? So the book of Ephesians. Everybody turn to the book of Ephesians. If you don't have it yet, it's in the New Testament. It's one of the, uh, the letters that Paul wrote. If you don't have it yet, I'm not going to have it there because I want you to actually bring your Bibles or actually have it in front of you, okay? And so the book of Ephesians, in order for you to get a better appreciation kung ano nangyayari dito on what's happening here, you have to go to Acts 19 at some point, okay? Note that. Because that's when Paul went to Ephesus. That's when he started spreading the gospel in that... Because if you got to look at... Um, you got to look at Ephesians as kind of like the micro. It's like Paul's perspective on what's happening. Acts 19 is kind of like the macro. It's what's historically happening. Where did he go? How did he interact with them? How was the culture there? How was the spiritual atmosphere? Are you, are you, um, are you following me here? So Acts 19 is kind of like what he did, where he went and stuff like that. Ephesians 2 is basically his perspective and his instruction on the people that are there. Okay? So that's Ephesians 2 is the micro. Uh, Acts 19 there is the macro uh, perspective. Ephesians is one of the prison epistles. That means that Paul wrote it while he was in prison. If, for you guys who don't know who Paul is, he is one of the apostles that gave his life to Jesus after Jesus rose and died again. And basically what he did was he had a powerful encounter with Jesus and he is, at that moment, the greatest missionary. He went the farthest, farther than any other disciple that Jesus had. And he shared uh, Jesus in Asia Minor and everything like that. And this is an actual historical fact. So he went different places and started just talking about the message of Jesus Christ. That is the Paul that we're talking about here. And then what he did was he started to write letters of instructions to the churches there so that they know because he knows that his time is limited. And in order for him to be effective in continuously feeding them properly, he has to write down what his instructions are because he doesn't know where his life is going to be in the next little while here, especially because he's in prison, okay? So he wrote it down so that he can give this to people and people can read it and, okay, this is what Paul was talking about. These are instructions that he's talking about, okay? The city of Ephesus, let me talk about really quickly what's happening in the, kind of like the, the climate. It's kind of like if you go to Las Vegas, you have, if you do a little bit of research on what's happening there economically um, with the people, demographic and stuff like that, you have a better appreciation of the city if you know what's happening in there. Is that true? The city of Ephesus was a large trading center in Western Asia Minor. Ephesus had a harbor that provided major shipping routes. In addition, Ephesus was situated at the intersection of major land routes. And so basically, this was a trading center because they have a dock right there where ships can come in and goods and services can be provided to the city there, okay? So this is a really good economic place. This is a, this is a place that's thriving, okay? This is a place of business, a marketplace, a profitable place with a strong economic state. Now let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the religious climate that was happening in Ephesus. 
Ephesus had the honor of being the guardian of the great Artemis of, and of her image which fell from heaven. We see that in Acts 19.35 where they believe that this, this is given to them by, uh, by the gods there of, of Olympus. The temple of Artemis, the Roman goddess Diana, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So can somebody name me one of the wonders of the world today? Great Wall of? Great Wall of China. Underground River. Okay? So this back then were some of the, the places that people just go to. It's like a tourist attraction. It's like people come there. So that's probably one of their, uh, their, the things that drive their economy there too is that there is this, um, this statue that was given from the heavens, so they believe. The temple of Artemis, the Roman goddess Diana, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the influence of the Artemis cult per- pervaded every facet of life in the city. Artemis was considered the guardian of the city. Her temple, her temple served as the primary banking institution of the city. Her image grazed the coinage, so they were on the, on the coins that they had, and festivals and games were held in her honor. And so they were worshiping Artemis, okay? So Paul comes in, and what does Paul find? He's like, these people need Jesus. Like, they don't know what the truth is. And now, today, we know that those things that they believed were, their myths. It's a mythology, Right? But we know now today still that what the message of Jesus Christ is a fact. It's a historical fact. It's truth. It's based on truth. The audience was the, uh, was the believers. The audience for Ephesians 2 was the believers he left behind and were growing in Ephesus. And it seems like one of his goals throughout this book is to give a clear understanding of the gospel and the practical applications that should result in a believer's life. So Paul is writing to them in Ephesians 2 specifically. He's talking about the results of because of what Jesus did. Are you following me so far? Okay, so this is a little bit of just painting a picture of what we're talking about here. And then we're going to go right into uh, the three points that I want to just drill to everybody in here. And then we'll get you out of here. Um, This is where we come in today. I want to share with you three priceless gifts or what I call trade-offs. John Maxwell, in in his book, 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth, One of the things that he shared was, in order for you to grow, there has to be a trade-off. If you need, here's the thing, whoever you hang out with the most, you will become like them. You'll become the average of who you hang out with the most. If you want to grow, you need to give those friends up for a season and actually be around people that push you, raise you higher, and sharpen you. Is that true? In order for you to get out of debt, you have, there has to be a trade-off. You actually have to give up these old bad habits that you have and actually start getting better habits or developing better habits. Is that true? In order for you to get out of a life of sin, there has to be a trade-off. You have to say yes to Jesus. Is that true? So there are three trade-offs that I want to share with you, and I believe they are priceless gifts that Jesus gave us when he let himself become the sacrifice. These gifts, the world has counterfeit versions that the enemy wants you to think are better, but they are just that. They are counterfeit versions. And let me tell you, I, for a lot of you who came into, the, to the, came into your faith a little bit later in life and you got to actually you know, rebel against God, say, I don't care, I'm just going to do whatever I want, you know that a lot of these are counterfeit versions. That God wants to give you something good, but the world has this counterfeit version. And my grandfather, I've always shared this in this space, always told me and told his kids that we don't have to make the mistakes in order to learn from them. We can learn from other people's mistakes. Because learning those mistakes yourself will cost you time and money. Is that true? And that is very, 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 very valuable. And so I want to share this with you because I, maybe I, I can paint a picture and save somebody in here who is going down that path or, or who is in that path and tell you there is something more, there is something superior. This faith that we have is not just something we show up in a building for. It is so practical in every area of life that if we listen to it, our lives would just skyrocket. Absolutely skyrocket, okay? So... Um, I want to share with you three priceless gifts that Jesus gave us when he let himself become the sacrifice. These gifts, the world has a counterfeit version that the enemy wants to make you think are better, but they are just that, counterfeit versions that will steal, kill, and destroy the good that God has for you. My goal for today is to help you see that to follow God is not to choose an inferior life, but rather a superior one. And so I got three trade-offs that if you want to take notes, psychologically, 
you actually will retain things better if you take notes. And so I strongly encourage you, I'll give you a root beer even if you take notes, okay? That's your reward. What? You're taking notes. Good job. Okay. We got three trade-offs, all right? So the first one that we see here, and we're going to start just going through some passages. These three, I believe, summarizes a lot of what um, Ephesians 2 talks about. I don't have time to go into the whole passage, and so I'm going to go through them. Death. One of the greatest gifts that Jesus gave us is death in the best way possible. Being dead to sin. So if you want to write that down, the first one is death. Ephesians 2. Okay, I'm going to go into it now. I'm going to read this to you. Or how about everybody? Everybody read this with me, so we're kind of interacting with each other. But on the yellow parts, I want you to really read it nice and loud, okay? Everybody ready? Ready, set, go. Once you were dead... There you go. Wait, wait, you didn't raise your volume there. Okay, you're going to try that one again. Verse 3, ready, set, go. One of the greatest results of the gospel is death. The death of the one thing that causes the greatest amount of destruction in any person's life. And that's an obsessive desire to sin. Can everybody say amen to this? If you don't know why you have this habitual thing that is so bad and so destructive, but you keep falling into it, it is because of this obsessive desire to sin. That is what we call our fallen nature. If you are frustrated with yourself because it's like, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it. I always lean towards this thing that I know I'm not supposed to be doing. That is your obsessive nature to sin. That is called, that's the carnal side of ours. That's the fallen nature side of us. Okay, you can write that down. I'm seeing some people are writing things down. It's good. One of the greatest results of the gospel is death. The death of the one thing that causes the greatest amount of destruction in any person's life, an obsessive desire to sin. Jesus did not just die for our sins. He died so that we can be set free from desiring continuously to sin. And that is the root of it. Our sins are basically kind of like leaves. The desire that, ah, that you just you know what I mean, right? Our, our natural bend to sin. Have you ever been, when it, you ever been a, must have happened when I was maybe six or seven years old. What do you know at six or seven years old? You're super young, right? But like, we were the Philippines then, and I stole this piece of candy, and I just like, to me, it just didn't seem wrong. And then our helper there was like, why did you take that? That I was like, oh shoot, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, I knew somewhat that it was wrong, but I was just kind of pretending. How do you, it's our, it's our, It's our bend towards that sin. That's what Jesus died for. It's not just the sin itself, although that is a massive part of it. But the bigger part of it is he cut off the tie. He cut off the the root. He, he, He yanked out the root so that we don't have to keep desiring to sin. Instead, we have this desire to want to please him. And to please him actually benefits you a lot. How many of you know this? If you've ever encountered God... Something that you used to celebrate that's not so good is now something that's completely iba na. Iba na ang perspective nyo. Everybody agree? Is that true? It's like, parang may mali. When you're doing that thing, it's like, this is not right. Are you feel, are you, 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 you get what I'm saying here? Because Jesus paid a price for you. And so the moment you realize, I, I remember it so clearly when God encountered me and there were some things that I was doing that I, I started trying to get back to it even after he encountered me, and I was like, something is wrong. But before, I was like celebrating it, right? But now you're like, something's wrong. And I didn't even know what it was, but I just knew. 
That's because that's what he died to cut off, is that obsessive desire to keep sinning. And then we have Romans 6.1. I don't know if it's there. Is Romans 6.1 there? No, I don't think so. Okay. Romans 6.11, but not 6.1. 6.11. If you want to write that down, I'm going to read it to you. Romans 6.11. Romans 6.11. It says here, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your bodies any longer. This is really key here. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. So if you actually let that thing thrive, you're naturally going to just obey what it says. But because of what Jesus paid for, and this is one of the greatest things because I, I work with broken people all the time, okay? Sometimes I catch people at their greatest brokenness. And the one thing that I see as a common thread, a common denominator in all of them, is that there is that desire for sin that just didn't die. But this is what Jesus paid for. When, Jesus, when we say yes to Jesus, we don't really, we sin, we fall short sometimes, but we don't want to. There is this, this desire, this, this hunger to not, to fight, to not give up. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you do, because you're in that faith. What does this mean? It means that your inclination to sin is no longer your bend. It's not your go-to. It's not your reset. It means that you can and will defeat the habitual sin you constantly struggle with because you now have a different master. If you don't get what I'm talking about, I'm going to illustrate a little something here for you. Let's say you work for Shell Canada, right? Or whatever company you work for, Trans, Trans Canada or whatever it is, okay? So you, you work for Shell Canada and you resign. You're like, you know what? It's time for me to transition. My job here, it's done. I need to just, I know, I need to learn more, move on. I get another job opportunity, whatever it looks like. So if you work for Shell and then you resign, do you still have to take orders from your boss from Shell? Okay, so here's the illustration. Imagine you switch companies and now you work for Petro Canada and your boss from Shell calls you and says, hey, can you file this? Can you send this? Can you do this? How would you respond? You would shout? <laughs> what if they were a good boss? <laughs> so what would you, how would you respond? So you're in, you're, in, you're in your new office. You're learning. You're getting oriented. Different, and your boss calls you. He's like, hey, Pedro, uh, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? Would you still do it? I want to hear it. Everybody say. No. Being dead to sin is the same way. You now have a different master, a different Lord. And what he tells you to do is what you can and will do. And now I want to, this is what Jesus died for, for us to be able to live a life more liberated than ever. Okay? This is what he died for. Now I'm going to present to you the counterfeit version of the world is saying. Because again, this is what I'm trying to explain to you, right? Is that, you know, a lot of people will come to you, a lot of people don't understand why we do what we do, and they'll be like, oh, I, you guys don't enjoy, you don't have a good time and stuff like that. Because for me, let me, let me ask a person, like, what do you call as a good time? Ah, you know, we go, we go do this, we go do that, we go do this, and the next day you barely remember what happened. They're like, well, let's see if that is something that is superior or something that is inferior, okay? The flip side, what the world offers. This is what the world offers, okay? Go and do whatever makes you happy, what makes you feel good is good. Right? That's the premise of it. That's what the world offers. But on the flip side, God is saying, or Jesus is saying, this is what I paid for. I paid so that you can be dead to sin. And here's the thing. I didn't pay so that you can't live anymore. John 10.10, 10, he says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. Have it more abundantly. So this, what the... Uh, but the flip side, what the world offers, will actually steal from you. It will kill you. It will destroy you. You know what I'm talking about. Yes? You know it. Those little things that seem like they insignificant, but it's what the world is saying you to do. It will steal from you. It will kill something. It will destroy something. Here's the danger in that mentality. We are almost always prone to self-destruction. Is that true? We turn simple pleasures into obsessions and gifts from God as addictions. Is that true? We turn simple pleasures into obsessions and gifts from God as addictions. 
When he calls us to holiness and die to our sins, he's not asking for us to be monks who do nothing and just sit there and restrict our lives from any kind of pleasure. I think that's a misconception because God is the one that invented pleasure. He's the one that invented joy. He's the one that invented how for us to be able to enjoy the life that he gave us. So I think it's an absolute lie, and we have to debunk that right now, that the Christian life is boring. If your Christian life is boring, meet up with me and let's talk because I need to correct that in your mind, in your spirit. If you're bored with your Christian life, like in our, in our faith life, in our Christian walk, it's just God shows me revelations about finances, shows me revelations about instructions how to be successful in ministry, shows me revelations on how I can be a better husband. It's just so good. Shows me revelations of people where I just meet up with them because I want to serve God and I want to love this person. All of a sudden, they become a really good friend of yours for life. It's just so good. He brings the right people into your life. But here's the flip side. The enemy will steal from you. He will kill things that are precious to you. He will destroy things that mean a lot to you. Superior, inferior. You be the judge. When he calls us to holiness and die to our sin, he's not asking for us to be monks. He, he is calling us to know what it's like to live life to the fullest. All right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through that. Did you guys get the, me- the message in that one? Okay, the second one here, access. All right? So if you want to really remember them, there's three words that start with them. The first one is death. The second one is access. And then it's kind of just a quick explanation there. Access to heavenly resources and benefits. So if you want to write that down, feel free. So the first verse in the uh, passage from Ephesians 2 that we had there was 1 or 3 in the first one. This second one, we have uh, verse 18. All right? When you get home, this is your assignment, okay? I think the school system is really good at this. Um, is they teach and then you have assignments. When you get home, read Ephesians 2 as a family or read Ephesians 2 by yourself, okay? You need to get into this. I only have enough time to summarize it. I can't get through all of it. But what I want you to do is read Ephesians 2 as a family and see what the amazing benefits are for saying yes to Jesus. And if you're going to do this, and don't say yes if you're not, If you're going to do that when you get home with your family or by yourself, say yes. Good. Okay, for those of you that didn't, it's okay. It's your loss. (laughs) All right, so we're on number two. A second one is verse 18, access. For though, okay, everybody read this, and again, on the yellow part, elevate your voice, okay? Ready, set, go. Another great result of what Jesus paid for is access. Everybody say access. Oh, that reminds me of Trevor. (laughs) He's away right now, right? Yeah, right. Access to the king and all his benefits. Access to the king and all his benefits. Have you ever read Deuteronomy 28? Anybody ever read Deuteronomy 28? Put your hand up if you've read Deuteronomy 28. You haven't? Okay, okay. Some of you have. Listen to me. Listen, okay, if you're a Christian and you've never read Deuteronomy 28, you're missing out, okay? Are you, are you listening to me? If you're a Christian for 20 years and you've never read Deuteronomy 28, or maybe you read it and you just flew by it, read it. Somebody go to Deuteronomy 28 and tell me what the uh, title is there. Blessings in obedience, okay? These are the benefits that you, if you have insurance, like we have insurance here at church, right? It's like work insurance kind of stuff. We get to have benefits, medical, dental, and all that stuff. I read that stuff because I'm like, I want to know what my benefits are. I really do, every single one. Like sometimes Pastor Andoni asks me like, oh, we have that? Yeah, we do. I tell him because I'm like, I know these things because I want to make the best of it. Especially the massage one. The massage one is like, oh, it's so good. But Here, listen to me, okay? If you're a Christian and you don't know what you signed up for, the many benefits that God promises you, and I believe it's in numbers. Lord, please let that be right. Where he says, God is not a man that he should lie, not a man that he should change his mind. If he says it is, it will be. And so if you haven't read Deuteronomy 28, you haven't been living your life to the fullest just yet. Because if our God, who we call is true, says that's what's for us, then we have no other excuse but to live in that standard. Are you following me? Another great result of what Jesus paid for is access. Access to the king and all his benefits. 
the benefits of obedience and how often in that do we hear him say, I will be with you, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will be with you until the end of the age. But here, listen to me. Okay, we don't take advantage of this benefit often because so much, so much when life sucks. Everybody say, sometimes life sucks. Okay, now say it like you mean it. Sometimes life sucks. Ready, set, go. It does. Sometimes your car gets stolen, right? Sometimes my car, <laughs> your car gets broken into. Honestly, our car got broken into. It was like a, I had a duffel bag there, a Nike bag. I'm like, dude, if you just ask, I would have given it to you, man. I had like an iPod there, a pair of shoes. It was my gym bag. I'm like, if the guy just asked, I'd be like, dude, what else do you want from my car? I'll give it to you. You didn't have to smash my window, but of course. But sometimes life sucks. But why is it that when those times happen, when tough times happen, we are so quick to just depend on our own strength? In something that I've realized in myself, in the toughest seasons of my life, I really started to cling on to God and started to really believe like what uh, Brother Billy was singing up here is to really believe that it's going to be okay because he has me in the palm of his hands. Attacks will come, but he is my God, he is my Lord, and that means I have access to him. That means I have his backing. Let me ask you this. What if you had Bill Gates? Everybody know who Bill Gates is? Whoever it is, who super rich, super successful person that you want to put there, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, whoever it is, okay? What if you had Bill Gates tell you, live, spend, and pursue whatever you want to do. I got your back and I'll pay your bills. How would you live? To the fullest. We have somebody who is bigger, richer, and more loving than any of those guys. Why don't we tap into that? Are you, you, I'm trying to paint you a picture of like what we actually have here, right? Just every day, my wife hears it all the time. I'm like, oh, man, it's just so crazy. I'm just following God and all of a sudden I'm talking to somebody who could potentially just add so much value into me that could really prosper us in every aspect later on. I'm talking and I was just, I wanted to visit somebody. I wanted to love somebody and all of a sudden I was connected to some really successful people that I could learn from. I'm just here obeying God and all of a sudden somebody blesses us with things that we need and it's just, this is what we have. Our God is a good father. If you feel like he's not taking care of you, maybe we're not tapping into him. Are you following me so far? We have access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's kind of like, you know, in the Avengers, in the very first Avengers, and uh, Iron Man was like talking to Loki, Loki, and he was like, we have a Hulk. You know what I mean? That scene, do you know that? That's like what we have. It's that confidence because we have a Hulk. His name is Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? All right, so that's what we have in Jesus. But on the flip side, this is what the world offers, okay? You want to know what the world offers? You get whatever you work for with your own strength, but unforeseen circumstances and the ruler of this world, the enemy, won't make it easy for you, and he will steal, he will kill, he will destroy. Though you can get whatever you want, but your limitation is your own strength. On the flip side, what, the, what, what Jesus is offering is that there is no limitation to what I, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, no mind can comprehend. Somebody finish the verse for me. What God has in store for those who love him and, come on, man, that is so good, so much better than what the world is trying to offer us. The world is saying, work hard, do this. But you know what? Stuff happens. The economy goes down the drain sometimes, all these things. But God is saying, I got your back. I got your back. And he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you. I'm going to stick it out with you. Even looking at, thinking about Malachi 3, 10 to 11. He's saying, honor me with your finances and watch me fill your barn so much that it'll overflow. Watch me rebuke the devourer. That means those are the things that rob from us. And he's saying, I got your back. That's what he's saying. But here's the flip side. The world is saying, you can work as hard as you want, but then, you know, economy happens, this happens, and that happens. And at the end of the day, you know, such is life. Inferior, superior. You be the judge. If you lived knowing that Bill Gates will pay for whatever it is, he's got your back, 
You won't live in scarcity, scarcity or lack, that's for sure. We have one greater than Bill Gates, and we have a full access to him because of what Jesus paid for. How differently would you live if you knew you had a God on your side? And he is actually for you. He's not somebody who's far distant. He's somebody who is so alive and active and is involved in every area of your life. Is this something that is superior or inferior? I'm on my last point here, okay? So last one is seated. So it was what? The first one was? Death. Second one was? A third one is? Seated. Seated. Seated with Christ. This one doesn't have any yellow, so everybody read this nice and loud. Ready, set, go. The most important thing that Jesus made available for us is unity with Christ, unity with the Father. Yun yung naputol. That was the thing that was severed when sin entered the world, is that relational connection with God. But when Jesus died on the cross, this was repaired. Everybody say, Amen. This seated and seated with Christ is one of the greatest gifts that he gave us. Because here's the thing. This is a positional thing. It is an identity thing. This is the single most important part of our faith journey. It's to realize our identity in Him. Because if we go about the Christian walk not knowing our position or identity in Him, we will try to fill that void in us with anything and everything that makes us feel good. And that in itself is dangerous. Is that true? If we don't know our identity with Him, even in ministry if you think about it, if we don't know our identity with Him, that we are His kids, we will work for Him instead of working with Him. Huge difference. Working for Him can cause you burnout. Working with Him, you're always filled. I'm thinking about the, uh, the, the parable of the prodigal son, right? Not the, not the son that umalis, but the son that stayed. Where he didn't realize he was under the house. He could have just ate whatever he wanted. He had full benefits. He didn't fully realize that. And if we don't realize our identity in Christ, in God... We will always be orphan spirited. Are you following me? You know what an orphan spirit looks like? Parating parang naubusan. Parating parang it's always you're running out. It's almost almost like you're you're being robbed of things. You're always so defensive because you're you know what I mean? I used to work at Camp Chesterman and sometimes kids are sent there who who don't have parents, who are foster kids. And they, you know that they have orphan spirit. Just the way they act, the way they interact with the other kids, and the way they act around you. It takes a lot longer for them to actually get, get comfortable. But here's the thing. When we don't realize our identity in Him, we will always just be longing for something, but we don't know what it is. Viktor Frankl, anybody know Viktor Frankl? Read any of his books? He's an Australian, Austrian, Australian, my gosh, completely different. Austrian neurologist. He's an Austrian neurologist and psychologist and a Holocaust survivor. So what happened in World War II there. And he speaks of how important it is for the human spirit to have purpose through suffering. Why? Purpose leads to hope. Whether that's hope that you'll see a loved one again or hope that tomorrow can be better. It is this very thing that dictated whether one would survive the concentration camps or die. The lack of identity leads to a lack of purpose. Lack of purpose leads to a lack of hope, and a lack of hope leads to emptiness. And that emptiness is a very dark place. Is that true? You know this. If you've ever lived away from God, outside of God, you know that emptiness is so real. One of the greatest gifts he gave us is the gift of identity that we are seated with him. That he is, we are not just cleaners. We are not just servants. We are his friends seated with him. That we are his children. 
one of the greatest gifts he gave us. I need you to get this because there's a lot of us who don't know that we're actually his kids. We act like we are just strangers to his home instead of us sitting at his feet, being like his little babies. The greatest gift he gave us is the gift of identity and in turn, the gift of purpose. And that purpose gives us life. This is one of the greatest gifts that he made available for us when he died on the cross. Here's the flip side. This is what the, the world offers. Your value, your identity is dictated by what you own, who you know, how many likes or attention you get on social media, your career, your job, you name it, your title. Is that true? That your value is dictated by how much you make, who you hang out with, how many likes you get on Facebook. That's what the world says. Obsess over that. That's what makes you important. But on the flip side, Jesus is saying, you, I don't love you because you do stuff. I love you because you're you. And the stuff that you do, that's just a benefit. That's just a bonus because I know you're going to love me back because you know your identity. Man, that is so important because if we don't know our identity, we won't know our purpose. If we don't know our purpose, we will lose hope. And that, when, that, when hope leaves, that's when suicide comes in. Is that true? Suicide is almost always um, partnered up with the idea that there's no way out. One of his greatest gifts is for us to know our identity, that we are seated with him. Thank you, Jesus, for making that available. Let me ask you this. Superior, inferior. Superior, inferior. Did we pick something that is inferior or something that is far greater? Something less or something greater than anything we've ever, could ever just come up with on our own? You will have to decide that in your heart because the way you view this Christian faith, this relationship with God, this lifetime commitment to pursue him will be dictated by your attitude towards what he made available for us. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. That's for God. Give God a round of applause. So make it count. So here's my question, and we're going to wrap it up with this, and then we just have some, we're going to do tithes in our offerings, we're going to do some announcements, and then we're going to get you to enjoy Canada Day, okay? But here's my question for you. You have to decide if you picked something that is superior or something that is inferior. You have to decide in your heart if you know that you got something better. Because if you don't, let me tell you something, you will always go back to what felt good, the good old days when I can just do whatever I want. You always go back to that. But when you realize that you picked something good and you've settled that in your heart, nothing else will satisfy once you taste and see that he is good. So I want everybody to close your eyes real quick. Block out the distractions. You can be, you know, you can socialize later. But we want you to, to you got to decide that in your heart here, Okay. And, and I pray that as you decide that in your heart, you say yes to him for real. That you say yes to him, not because somebody brought you to church or somebody just brought, brings you here. It's got to be a personal thing. It's got to be something that you own. Because it is so much better than what the world offers. And I'm speaking from experience. I've tasted and I've seen what the world offers. It's not very satisfying. It actually leaves you hungrier. Some people, there was this, misconception for a long time that there's kids who were going to Max and 7-Eleven and stuff and they would go there to drink like energy drinks but then studies are actually showing those will dehydrate you faster than anything because of the caffeine level and stuff like that and so that's kind of like the world it gives you that quick boost of high but then at the end of the day you're emptier than ever let me tell you he can fill that he can fill the areas in your life that you need it filled but that's got to be something you'd settle in your heart. And without a doubt, you can't just be like, okay, I'm going to kind of be for you, but at the same time, I still like the world. You got to be all in. So I'm going to let the worship team uh, minister to you. And I believe the Holy Spirit's just going to speak to you right now. So don't check out yet. We're almost out of here, but close your eyes, block out distractions, and just... Do your thing.
do your thing with the Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit, just do your thing to Him. You gave life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you gave hope, you restore every heart that is broken. darkness you gave hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord great are you Lord singing great are Stand up.
I, uh, I believe that there's some people, and keep your eyes closed so people just have that vulnerability moment. So everybody just keep your eyes closed just to um, be courteous to other people here. But there's, there's, I think there are people in here or there's somebody in here or maybe it's a group of people, I don't know, uh, that is ready to, you're saying in your heart and your spirit, and I'm not even looking at you, I'm closing my eyes, you see? Um, you're saying, I want that superior thing. I've been, I've been drinking from this thing that just kept me being so, it just makes me even more thirstier. The more I try to satisfy, the emptier I feel. And you're, you're, you've gotten to the point this morning, and I believe it's like a divine appointment for you, that you're saying, God, I think I'm ready now. And I want to have that superior thing. I want to have that thing. I want to have what you paid for. And let me tell you that, brother. I'm a, let me tell you that, sister. Like, whoever you are, let me tell you. He's made it available for you right now. But you're going to have to take it. You're going to have to take a hold of it. And so if that's you, just really quickly, everybody's eyes kind of closed. Though, if you can just put your hand up. And I just want to pray with you. Good, good. You see that? Yeah, good. So you can put your hand down there. And I want you to just pray this prayer with me, okay? It's a tweaked version of the prayer that we're probably used to when Jesus, the message of Jesus is shared. But pray this with me. And I pray that it'd be the cry of your heart, okay? So just echo it. Jesus, I'm calling out to you. I've had a taste before, but now I want the real thing. I need you more than any other thing in my life, more than any other pleasure, more than any other need that I think I need. I need you. And so I just want to give you my heart. I want to make you Lord, not just Savior. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the leader. I want you to be the king. I don't want to just be following my own desires. Instead, I want to know what your plan is for my life that is superior to what this world offers and superior to what I've been experiencing. So right now, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and I give you my life entirely. Just take that time to just, just connect with God at this moment. I think he really wants to just connect with you and just give you those, just wants to speak to you. And oftentimes that is more than enough. Give you a few, just a few seconds, a few minutes here and then their hearts, God. 
rock their minds. Just touch them right now. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for what you're doing. We seal this in their hearts and in their minds. We seal this right now. For those of you that made that commitment, know this. A commitment, a covenant is only as good as both parties meeting. Both parties showing up. Jesus, God, will always show up. But you got to show up every time. He is willing to shape you and mold you and raise you up higher. But you got to show up every time. If you fail, get back up. If you get beaten down, get back up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. So, Father, we surrender this to you and we thank you for what you've spoken. We seal this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit into the hearts and minds of these, your people. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give God some praise.